Welcome to The Real News Network. I'm Jessica Devereaux in Baltimore. Iran is observing the 35th anniversary of the 1979 revolution, when the CIA-sponsored Shah was replaced by Ayatollah Khomeini and the establishment of Iran as an Islamic republic. It was a pivotal moment in struggles for influence across the Middle East. It's also nearly 35 years since the U.S. began introducing sanctions against Iran. Here to discuss this historic moment is Hamid Debashi. Hamid is a professor of Iranian studies and comparative literature at Columbia University. Hamid, thank you for joining us. My pleasure, anytime. So Hamid, we often hear the um, revolution being called the Islamic Revolution. Can you actually deconstruct that? In fact, that's the best question and the best place to start. Uh, involved in the mobilization of masses of millions of uh, people in order to topple the uh, monarchy of uh, Pahlavi regime. We're also socialists, we're also anti-colonial nationalists. Historically, you can begin the narrative that led to the 1977-1979 revolution, either with the nationalization of Iranian oil in 1950, early 1950s by Mohammad Mossadegh, which gives the revolution a potent anti-colonial nationalist element, which, as you just referred in your introduction, resulted in a CIA the sponsored coup of 1953 that toppled the democratically elected Mossadegh and brought Shah back to power in 1953. But if you begin in 1963, when the uh, Ayatollah Khomeini led an unsuccessful uprising against the Shah, you can give it actually an Islamic uh, element. But if you begin with early 1970s, when a very powerful uh, a guerrilla uprising, urban and rural guerrilla uprising, uh, was involved uh, in anti Pahlavi uh, struggles, uh, will have a, a decidedly Marxist uh, dimension. So, in order to have a comprehensive perspective of Iran early in the, uh, in the revolution, namely from 1977 to 1979, you need to bring all these three forces, namely anti-colonial nationalism of the Mossadegh uh, genealogy and Islamist uh, aspect of Ayatollah Khomeini and, uh, of course, the Marxist element of the, uh, uh, to their party of the 1940s and Cherikai uh, Khal of the 1970s, all involved at the moment of the revolution, that in the aftermath of the revolution, when the Shah toppled, was toppled, Khomeini and his lieutenant managed to outmaneuver the other revolutionary forces and given decidedly Islamist aspect to the revolution should not be confused with the earliest stages of the revolution, whether we look at it historically from the 1950s or immediately at the time of the revolution in the mid 1970s, it had multiple aspects, which included, of course, Islamic forces, but by no stretch of imagination was limited to Islamic uh, forces. And Hamid, after Ayatollah Khomeini rose to power in 1979, how did the relations change between the U.S. and Iran? Well, the uh, relation changed because uh, all the oppositional forces, including the, the, the Islamic forces, were united in their disapproval of the cozy relationship that the Shah had developed in the aftermath of the coup of 1953 uh, with uh, the uh, United States. And in effect, uh, the entirety of Iran was a major military base. Uh, for United States uh, regional uh, interest. And in fact, Iran was even used as a strategic point during the Vietnam War. But also economically, uh, during the Arab oil embargo of 1973, Iran did not join the embargo. And as a result, in the mid-1970s, Shah's income from the oil revenue skyrocketed into masses of millions of dollars, which he reinvested in the American arm industry. And AWACS, for example, you're too young to remember AWACS, but historically you know, AWACS, uh, this uh, radar-carrying uh, aircraft, were in fact developed with the money that Shah gave to the uh, American uh, military establishment uh, at the time from the oil revenue that uh, he had achieved in the aftermath of the Arab oil embargo. Okay, let's fast forward to present day. Give us a sense of the theocracy. Um, discuss with us what, what is it actually like? Who's in power? Break that down for us, please. Uh, you have to remember that in the, at least the first decade of the revolution, that is from, say, 1979 to 1989, until the death of Ayatollah Khomeini in 1989, 
the Islamists spent uh, initially the 444 days of uh, hostage crisis, and after that, the eight-year war between Iran and Iraq in order to eliminate all uh, the rivals. These elimination included in, included mass execution of political prisoners, uh, particularly in the 1980s, university purges, cultural revolutions, uh, trying to bring a multifaceted and cosmopolitan political culture and the control of an Islamic Republic, paramount on which is this idea of Belayat al the absolute authority of a of a Shi cleric uh, of uh, of highest uh, learning, that Ayatollah Khomeini in fact imposed on the constitution uh, when it was being drafted uh, in late 1970s. In the aftermath of uh, the death of Ayatollah Khomeini, the uh, the theocracy has continued to consolidate its forces and generate a network, an apparatus of military intelligence and security apparatus over which presides this clerical uh, establishment, the representative of which is Ayatollah uh, Khamenei. And they have, in effect, uh, occupied the entirety of Islamic Republic's uh, uh, the uh, theocratic apparatus. And the way that they have kept themselves in power is to make themselves very present and very indispensable in the geopolitics of the region. A quick look at the time of the revolution tells you that Americans and Europeans and their uh, regional allies were very upset with the revolution of 1979 and began to generate two bumper zones around the uh, Iranian revolution. One was by uh, arming Saddam Hussein early uh, in the revolution and encouraging him to invade and occupy Iran in 1980, a bloody war that raged between Iran and Iraq in 1980s, and as a result, uh, uh, what it did was prevented the spread of the Iranian revolution into the Arab world. And on the other side, they created the uh, the Taliban, which you, you may remember, uh, uh, President Reagan brought the Taliban to the White House and referred to them as the functional equivalent of our founding fathers. So both the Taliban in the East, in Afghanistan, and Saddam Hussein in the West were meant to curtail the spread of the uh, revolution of 1979. And both these events, especially the Wahhabi Sunni disposition of the uh, uh, movement in Afghanistan, which was meant to do two things, both to expel the, uh, the Soviets at the time, and also to uh, prevent the spread of Shi-inspired uh, Iranian revolution succeeded in doing so. So the Iranian revolution in effect degenerated inside and became theocratic, as I just said. But these two monsters, namely the uh, the Taliban that degenerated into Al-Qaeda and uh, uh, so forth, and also Saddam Hussein, later on in the following decades, became to came back to, uh, one by invading Kuwait you remember that uh, started the first Gulf War and one by giving birth to al Qaeda and the terrorist activities of the uh, beginning of the uh, 1990s all the way to the events of uh, 9/11 so Islamic Republic uh, effectively made itself very powerful banking on the follies of US and its European and regional allies uh, committing one atrocity uh, after another, whether it was by in, uh, invasion of Iraq or by invasion of Afghanistan or by the second invasion of uh, 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 Iraq, in all of which Iran began to cultivate a soft power. And as you see today, is exceedingly powerful in Syria. It is powerful in Iraq. It is powerful in Bahrain, in Yemen, uh, in the entirety of the, of the region. And the question of the nuclear uh, uh, issue. Uh, as you know, when President Obama called President Rouhani, the least on his mind, on President Obama's mind, was actually the nuclear issue. Most importantly was to recruit President Rouhani's support for his projects in Syria in particular. To make a long story short, today Iran is internally very vulnerable because of uh, the huge movement that began in 2009 in the form of green movement against its uh, legitimacy. But the regionally, it can maneuver its forces, its soft power in a manner that makes it very useful, particularly to Obama administration and its regional allies. 
Hamid, I'm so glad you brought up the Green Movement because I want to discuss how it's been four years, really, since that movement um, faded from Iran. What struggles do you think remain for, for Iranian citizens? In fact, to become full citizens and to become capable of changing uh, their administration uh, with element of trust in the, in the government. They didn't trust the last election, but they invested their trust in Rouhani. There is, a, there is a minimum of trust in this recent election. And as you see, whether it is internally or regionally, Rouhani is beginning to have a far different administration to Ahmadinejad. But it doesn't mean that Iran is now all hunky-dory. There are still political prisoners prisoners of consciousness. The press is not free. Women's rights uh, uh, issues are, are very much uh, under pressure. There has just been a labor unrest in Iran, uh, which has been severely crushed, and the leaders of it ha have been uh, arrested and put in jail. The students' uh, organizations are in uh, are under pressure. The, th the three forces that can actually challenge the theocracy are student movements, women's rights movements, and labor movements. And it is precisely those three movements that the ruling regime is not tolerant. It has created, it has now uh, an administration which is more, more, far more palpable uh, in terms of its affinity with popular demands in the figure of Rouhani, but in terms of its infrastructure, which remains a theocratic, it has not changed. However, by uh, virtue of shifting the focus from the internal affairs to the regional issues, as you know, uh, the entire region is in is in uh, jeopardy, not just in Syria, but in uh, Egypt, in Bahrain, or all over the place. Iran can m manipulate the geopolitics of the region in a manner that, because it is indispensable to United the States' interest in the region, can camouflage its internal issues. All right, Hamid. In part two of our conversation with you, we really want to discuss the Iranian nuclear negotiations. Um, so please, viewers, uh, check out part two of this conversation. Thank you so much for joining us, Hamid. My pleasure. And thank you for joining us on The Real News Network.